Aloha. Aloha. I've been in Hawaii. <laughs> Do you know what Hawaii means? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it means inspiration, water, and the divine. I've been inspired in the divine waters of Hawaii, and I want to share that with you. Ha means inspiration. The W-A, wa, means water, and the I, the double I, is the divine. Isn't that beautiful? And aloha, aloha, of course, is a greeting. It's a hello and it's a goodbye, but it is so much more, and I've hardly scratched the surface of what it really is. But a little bit of what I've been shown and taught by, by friends like Kaleo and Elise and, and other sources is that aloha is about unconditional love. It's about compassion and peace, and it's about the breath of life the energy of the breath of life. And all of that is exchanged when we say aloha. So it's very similar in my mind and experience to namaste in the sense that there is a real honoring of the divinity in another as we say aloha. And you can even hear in the word the breath, right? The ha, that is the breath that we are exchanging, the breath of life, the breath of the one who breathes us, the divine. All of that in a greeting. Isn't that beautiful? So um, aloha, according to Kahona David Bray, simply in the old times, the old Hawaiian way would have just been succinctly said, God in us. Aloha is God in us, a recognition of that. And also some of the older teachings, the spirit of aloha was taught to the children. And what the children were taught was that they are a part of all. And they are being, as, and that allness is being a part of them. And so it is inseparable, right? This divinity, this, this allness of God, the source, the, the divine. And that where there is pain, there is pain in themselves. And where there is joy, there is joy in themselves. That there is no separation in life between us, between all of life, and between the divine and, and ourselves. And they were taught to respect their creator, that they were a part of that creator, that the creator was a part of them, and also to not intentionally do any harm to anyone or anything. That sounds like a, a really nice foundation, doesn't it? <laughs> to teach our children, to teach all children, and to remind all of us children, right, as we grow, to, to be reminded to come back to those basic ideas, those truths, that's why we come here, right, together every Sunday and during the week and all the times that we gather as a community to remember, to, to, to know the spirit of aloha, to know that we are in a place of unconditional love, to know that we are the very essence of unconditional love, to know that we are being breathed by the very presence of God together and we are exchanging that breath of life. When we can be present to all of that, all the little things in life, all the little things we get twisted up about, <laughs> the things that we think are problems and concerns and, and issues and the things that we judge, it just all falls away, doesn't it? Living within the spirit of aloha is a practice called ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono, as you've been introduced to already, is a very s simplified version, is the four phrases that we just sang in the chant and, and chanted together in the meditation. It's a, originally the traditional Ho'oponopono is about bringing together a family or a group or a community wherever there is discord and working through that discord into, it's a process of forgiveness and reconciliation. And in the traditional method, you'd have a, a kahuna or a, a mediator who is well respected in the community who would be mediating the process, which is about deep listening, sharing from the heart honestly, what is going on with you, and the rest of the community all holding a space for that. The whole idea is for clearing, for forgiveness, for uh, confessions, for attesting and, and making amends, and whatever needs to be said and done. And the one who is mediating is clear about asking the right questions, about allowing the process to deepen and to flow in just the right way. So I don't know about you, but if you've ever had any kind of discord with your family or any, anything whatsoever, any disagreements, tensions, 
Never? No. You ever been like, as adults, come back into the house together and been there for a week together, and then the old family patterns and family dynamics rise up? Anybody? So I've been with my family in Hawaii for a week, and we shared a condo. <laughs> And we love each other, and we enjoy each other, truly. And sometimes I'm not really even aware of the family dynamics until an outsider, such as my partner, Brenly, who's not at all an outsider, but hasn't spent as much time with my family, comes into the dynamic and lives with us for a week, right? And so I found myself sort of midweek. This is usually what happens when I take people on spiritual trips. If there's any troubles, it's midweek. It's this the arc of how things work. So about midweek, um, there were competing needs going on and competing feelings, and I felt pulled in the middle. Renly needed and felt a certain way, and my mom and my niece and my sister, and what was that? what's a girl to do, right? <laughs> so, uh, so Brenly and I decided to stay home that night while everybody else went out to dinner, and we did some counsel together and really cleared the air between us. We did not address the family dynamics, however. We had two more glorious days together, and we were just going to enjoy everyone and love everyone and be in the beauty of who we are in our imperfections, right? All of us together. And so that's exactly what happened. In the process, if we had done traditional honoponopono in a family, it would have looked very much like what I just described. The beginning of that process always begins in, in the Hawaiian culture, in the traditional Ho'oponopono, with a prayer and the calling in of the ancestors, which is exactly what Kaleo and Elise did for us at the beginning of the meditation. And then at the end of the process, it's closed with a prayer, and then everybody has a really nice meal together, which is very much a Hawaiian tradition to have a meal together. My family's totally got that part down. <laughs> We are having lunch, and there are conversations about what we're having for dinner. <laughs> and it's great. We eat a lot of great food, so it's, it's lovely. It's a lovely way to commune and connect, right? So the traditional honoponopono um, has a new kind of updated, modernized version that I want to tell you a little bit about. It was developed by a kahuna named Morna Simeona. Morna was actually came by her healing very naturally. She was the daughter of a kahuna. Her own mother was a kahuna. And her mother was kahuna or advisor, in a way, to the last monarch in the kingdom of Hawaii. It was um, a queen. Um, and she was the only queen and the last monarch. And, and so she was um, in consultation. And then Morna, as her young daughter, was constantly in that field of energy in that way of being, in that sacred wisdom. So it came very naturally to her. And she became a Lomi Lomi massage therapist and a very well-known one who had clients such as Jackie Kennedy and Lyndon, J, J, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson and, um, did I say his name right? It sounded right, LBJ, yeah. And um, Arnold Palmer, I mean, just a lot of people that were well-known um, came to her. So she was a well-known healer. And what she noticed was that the Western mind needed some healing. <laughs> that we were quite out of balance, you know, that there was a sense of the intellectualism of the West had really kind of squeezed out, in a way, space for the divine. So when we are so focused in our thinking minds and think our conscious mind is, is it, that's all there is, we don't really leave much space for that breath, that aloha, that spirit to move, right? And so she saw an opportunity there to bring the ancient Hawaiian teaching of Ho'oponopono in a new way, because she also noticed that the modern family system was quite different, and that there weren't a lot of opportunities where whole families were gathered together or whole communities were to gathered together to practice regularly. So she developed an updated version called self-identity Ho'oponopono. Sometimes it's abbreviated at S-I-H or S-I-T-H, self-identity through Ho'oponopono. And this process is a very individualized process in which we heal ourselves. Anything that's going on in the world, a reflection that is healed within us. 
And so this process is really quite amazing. She started in 1976, and Morna traveled the world teaching this practice. She taught it at universities. She taught it to businesses. She presented several times at the United Nations in hopes that it would roll out to countries as a peacemaking tool. And in 1983, she was named a living treasure of Hawaii. So she was really honored for this work. The basic way that it works, you know, in unity and meta unity metaphysics, we talk about the three phases of mind. Well, they use the exact same phases of mind, subconscious, conscious, and superconscious minds, right? Those are all three aspects of our own minds. And, and so the, the superconsciousness touches divinity. It's God mind. Uh, in the Honoponopono tradition, there's also divine intelligence, which is the allness or the source. In, in unity, we've kind of combined those and just call it one superconsciousness. I don't want you to get too hung up on the, on the concepts, but superconsciousness, interestingly enough, is called Amakua, which we have every second Friday here at Unity, um, a Hawaiian um, influenced celebration with drumming and meditation and so on. So that superconsciousness is the God mind that we have access to at all times. The conscious mind is really that the aware mind that knows that you're sitting here, that you're listening right now, that you're at Unity of Walnut Creek, that it's Sunday, that it's 12:15 in the afternoon. You know, this is the conscious mind's knowing of the world. So many of us just walk around in the world thinking that's all there is, is, is the conscious mind. And this is where we get so focused on this intellectualism and thinking that's all there is and not giving space for this process. But here's where the real work happens. It's in the subconscious. Charles Fillmore said, the subconscious has no power to think on its own. It doesn't have the power to think. It doesn't have the power to create. What the subconscious is is a storehouse. It's a basement, if you will a closet filled with your memories and your past ideas and thoughts and experiences. Can you imagine if from the very beginning of the time that you came in as that pure infant in this world and then had your little infant clothes and your little diapers and then your, your little you know, toddler clothes and all that, if you had kept all that in your basement since then, since the beginning, if you just had it filled to the brim, right? You just hardly could open the basement door if you could at all because it'd be so filled with stuff. That's kind of how the subconscious is. And so if there is no practice to release that which is in the subconscious mind, we're going to keep reacting from that place. See, anything that happens out in the world is not really happening out in the world. It's happening inside of us. It's our thoughts about the so-called problems of the world that cause us pain. Anything can happen around us, and we can be at peace with it. And then anything can happen around us, and we can push against it. We can resist. We can judge. We can blame. We can point outside of ourselves. But guess what? In Ho'oponopono, nobody gets off free. A hundred percent responsibility, not just for yourself, but for everything. That's what Ho'oponopono calls us to. I thought I heard about this years ago, and I just thought, oh, that's really sweet. That sounds really nice. Little chant. <laughs> I had no idea, really, until you know we were going to go to Hawaii this year. And I thought, oh, maybe I should learn a little more about Ho'oponopono. This stuff is deep. And it's a real, real practice for our times. So this, as we do this practice, what happens is we release those, that stuff in the storehouse. It, and we don't have to even look at it. You don't even have to worry about what it is. You, just, you do the practice, and it cleans. It cleans, it cleans, it cleans. And what happens when it cleans is it opens up space so that the light of the superconscious mind and the love of the divine heart can be opened up in us, can be freed, and that then becomes our conscious reality. See, if we're overstuffed with all this stuff, and we think we know, right? We think we know best. We think we're right. We think they're wrong. We're right. Clean. <laughs> Wherever we get in those moments, you know, and even within our own bodies where there's tension, where there's discomfort, where there's illness, we can do ho'oponopono. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. I I prefer I apologize over I'm sorry, but you use whatever works for you. It doesn't matter what order you go in. 
It's just these phrases that, that help clean the subconscious and open ourselves up. It's a practice, Morna said, of freedom. She said, clean, erase, erase, and find your own Shangri-La. <laughs> Where? Within yourself. The process is essentially about freedom, complete freedom from the past. So Morna had a student, had many students, but one particular student carried these teachings in an important way. His name is Dr. E. Haleakala Hulen. And Dr., often known as Dr. Hulen, Dr. Hulen was a psycho psychologist at the Hawaii State Hospital for a few years. And during that time, he took Ho'oponopono, this modernized version, this updated practice that was about the self-practice of taking full responsibility to clean and to erase and to heal. And he took this to the hospital. Now, one of the, the social workers there, her name was um, Omaka Okali Hamaguchi. And Omaka said that the experience was like, kind of like this. <laughs> so they had 30 patients. They were criminally, mentally ill patients. And they were most, all of them, shackled at the wrists and the ankles. If they left the ward, it was to go for a medical appointment or a court appearance. That there were violent episodes consistently, usually about three or four a day, where a patient attacked another patient, Sometimes a patient attacked a staff member or a patient attacked themselves. They were often put in seclusion in cement rooms, cement walls and ceiling and floor, a locked bathroom and no windows. They were highly medicated. She said the place was depressing, it was wild, it was intense. There was electrical problems. There were plumbing issues. The paint wouldn't even stay on the walls. The plants didn't grow. It was a very dark place. <laughs> staff didn't want to show up. There was disharmony in the staff, as you could imagine. Lots of sick leave. Not enough staff showing up because they didn't want to be at work. And yet another psychologist, this Dr. Hugh Len, shows up. And she's thinking, ho-hum, yet another attempt for some newfangled way of doing this. And they're going to get tired, and they're going to leave. And so in comes this man. He shows up late for work, usually. He doesn't seem to work at all. He doesn't do assessments. He doesn't do evaluations. He makes no diagnoses. He does no psychological testing. He doesn't even do therapy with the patients. What the heck is this guy doing? He seems to be just walking around, chatting with people, and laughing and enjoying himself. And, but everybody likes him. And everybody really seems to enjoy interacting with him. And so what Dr. Hugh Lin was doing was ho'oponopono. He would ask for the records of the, of the client or the patients. And he would read their records in his office. And he wrote, read about the heinous crimes they committed. And when he did, he had a reaction. <laughs> but what he knew was that reaction was 100% him. He was 100% responsible for whatever went on outside of him. It wasn't in the patients, he said. There was no problem with the patients. The error was in him. And so he did this practice. And he, did, he said the chant, and he cleaned and cleaned and cleaned those thoughts in his mind that were judgments, those ideas of blame, those whatever feelings that came up. And it was in this way, after a few months, that there were no shackles anymore. None of the patients were in seclusion anymore. In fact, the patients were starting to, to be released to be able to work or to play sports. After a while, more and more of them began to get curious about the practice, and some of the patients and the staff started doing Ho'oponopono as well. The electrical problems cleared up magically. No plumbing problems anymore. The paint that wouldn't stay on the walls, it would always peel off every time. Hugh Lin kept watching them paint the walls and then it would peel off again. He said, I love you to the walls. And the next time they were painted, the paint stuck. 
See, it's not even just animate objects, but inanimate objects can be loved. When he walks into a room, he notices how the room is and how it feels. Does the room feel tired? Does the room feel like it's got some heavy energies in it? What's the room's name, he says. He walks in with Joe Vitale for, Vitale for a, a workshop, and he says, oh, her name is Sheila, and she feels very tired and very unloved and unappreciated. And so he begins to love and appreciate the room until the whole energy of the place shifts. And so this work, this beautiful, simple practice is so profound. You know how it is with businesses that help people sometimes and helping professions will say, well, our job is to work ourselves out of business. You ever heard anybody say that? That quite literally happened with the Hawaii State Hospital. 28 of those 30 patients were completely healed and released. Two patients were transferred to another facility, and the whole facility closed down. That was after the understaffing problem became an overstaffing problem. <laughs> and that was just from a couple of years of work by this man who completely seemed to enjoy himself, walking around saying, I love you to himself as he was interacting with people. Thank you. Please forgive me. I apologize. So we can run this practice at all times. It can become like a constant mantra in our minds that we're saying while we're driving down the highway or when we're talking to somebody or while we're at work. We can do it as our meditation practice, our time apart, but we can also do it just all the time. If somebody's telling you how horrible the world is and how awful everything is in the world, you can just be silently saying, I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. Instead of getting into judgment, and blame, resistance, pushing away. Next time you watch the news and you get all, you know, tensed up, anybody ever do that? <laughs> oh, I can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe. Anybody do that? <laughs> well, instead of making that your chant, make your chant, please forgive me. Because it is when we stray from the divine that we feel the discord, the resistance, the pushing away, the divisiveness. It's in us, nowhere else. This practice is 100% responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for everything. So if you have up until now felt helpless about things going on in the world, you are no longer helpless. You have a tool available to you, and you have evidence from this story of how it can shift an entire mental, mentally ill criminal ward, how it can shift the person in front of you, but most of all, how it can shift you, because that's the only place we can do the work. The results will be the results as we see them, as we practice. The more we practice, most likely, the more we're going to experience the results. And one of the great results is that we ourselves are going to feel freer. We ourselves are going to open up space where the superconscious mind, the divine intelligence of the universe, can come easily and freely through us and embody us. Inspiration will come when we make space for inspiration. Inspiration means to be in spirit. And so to be in spirit, we need to let our conscious minds relax a little bit and allow this practice to clear out our subconscious minds to make way. Hugh Lynn said, there wasn't anything wrong with the patients. The error was in me. I had to take complete responsibility within myself for actualizing the problems outside of myself. I had to clean my toxic thoughts and replace them with love. The patients and even the war didn't feel love. I loved everything. In Zero Limits, a book written by Joe Vitale and Dr. Hugh Lin, there are, two, there are several principles, but two basic principles I just want to highlight today. One that I've already said, you are 100% responsible for all that you experience. And the second, you can heal whatever comes your way. I was able to snorkel a couple of times in Hawaii this week. And you know how it is. Has anybody been snorkeling before or scuba diving? So you know how that um, the breathing tube has that cord when you're under the water, it kind of you can hear your own breath really loud. It's sort of that echo. 
And so I'm swimming in those warm waters with the funny mask and the breathing tube and the fishy like fins, you know. And, and I'm just going above the coral. And then, and then these amazing beings, like things that you only see in aquariums are right there, you know, like an eel comes by. And then this, this fish, this purple and yellow fish with a little translucent skirt on comes by. You know, it's like, what is this? This is real. This is, you know, and then a sea turtle, you know, playing in the light and swimming like they do, like not a care in the world. And all the while I'm practicing Ho'oponopono. And I'm saying it out loud so I can hear it in that sort of stereo breath way that this thing under, underneath. So I'm hearing myself as I'm swimming along with them, saying to, to them and to me, I forgive you. Please forgive me, rather. Please forgive me. I apologize. I love you. Thank you. And they're just doing their thing, right? Because it doesn't have anything to do with them, really. It has everything to do with me. But what it allows me to feel is like I could contribute something to the health of the oceans, and I could contribute something to the health of the earth and the fish and the, and the turtles. And despite all the plastic straws that were used at the luau that we were just at, that there will be, you know, there will be this practice that I can do. There's this opportunity. There's this opportunity to heal the planet. There's this opportunity to heal me and take responsibility for me and thereby bring forth the healing around us. So it's a potent practice. It's a powerful po possibility for us. Most of all, we come together here to be the spirit of aloha. Aloha. I love you. Behold the divine in you. And I want to invite our friends Kaleo and Elise up to complete the circle. They're going to share with us an aloha chant by Pilahi Paki, Pilahi Paki, with a poetic response that Elise wrote herself. So what uh, Reverend Christian was saying about the subconscious, the subconscious is, is here. In the vaena, in the in the heart, the puvai, but it's also here, in the belly, in the womb, in this place of creation, mystery. In this place of unconditional love. So when you're doing ho'oponopono, you want to feel it from here. And from here, deep within. That's when it changes. So, so just taking a breath and tasting the breath. This is this is the ha, the breath. Tasting the breath and letting it glide down to soothe your heart, to embrace your heart, inhaling, caressing your heart, and on the next exhalation, just allow your breath to descend from the heart, your breath is sinking, Deeper and deeper, sinking your breath, descending down into the belly, and deeper down into the womb. And from this place, from the womb, just listen. Agai in Hawaii. Be gentle, Hawaii. From glistening back of black sand, climbing from the sea, to mountains white crown rubbing against the sky. Lo kahiakulike, be one and in harmony. Beneath rainbows arcing from the mist, 
curling around a seething crater's edge. Oh, Lulu, oh, Lulu, come now. Be kind in spirit. With harmonies of surf and wind, treble of birds, dream song of whales. Ha, ha, kokulana. Be humble in spirit. Humble as morning dew, resting lightly on the ama'u fern, as lehua blossoms offering of nectar to the curving beak of apapani. Ia Be patient and persevere. As we stand on the bones and sing the memories of those who have passed this way before us. A lay of souls, a circle of light and love. Mahalo kia kuhu, mahalo, aloha no. Mm-hmm.